<laughs> All right, gang. We had a nice little introduction to ABG. I'm going to skip the introduction because you already know who the heck I am. So we're going to do ABG. We had a nice little introduction this morning. And some of those cases are actually in this, so we can have to go a little bit quicker. The great minds do think of like. I think the discussion on DKA was right on point on. But remember that intubation stuff for the DKA patient. They will get a peri mortem, peri intubation, cardiac arrest. I'm going to give you the systematic minimalist approach to acetates. A little historical thing. This is the lecture that started it all for me. It's teaching again. Six years ago, I did this. And the slides are still modified. This is my first lecture in the real world. I came back to the Kobe six years ago. I just want to drag John Amate down to work at my hospital. You remember John. He's doing great, by the way. He's been a real act. I, and I tell people, I made John Amate an asset to community emergency medicine. I can do it for anybody. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, right. Anyway, so this is a systematic minimalist approach to acid base because there's nothing that wakes people out more than this. The cost of people who write about this want to look smart. So they put out a lot of confusing diagrams and they write these long chapters and kind of these crazy graphs, none of which you need to know. Actually, it's so easy. You can just use MD Calc and plug the numbers into your MD Calc and it will give you everything I'm doing. But I'd like you to at least think about, work with me and think through the problems. You can do it on your own. But if you're in a, in a world of hurt, you all got MD Calc on your phones. You're all millennials, millennials. You all got MD Calc. It's just in there. The winner's formula's in there. Everything's in there on your MD Calc. But that's not fun. So we'll try and do it on our own. Systematic and minimalist. Systematic, just like EKGs. Same system. Every patient, every time. Just like EKGs. Just like neuro exams. Just like whatever. The minimalist. I did this for uh, Dr. Gallagher. For in 1987, he had a lecture called The Minimalist Approach to Toxicology. Toxicology, where he said, basically, or nothing except the trauma level. So, everything I've done ever since is minimalist. But basically, I'm only going to do what you need to, and, which is kind of interesting because I'm an overutilizer, but anyway. Only what you need to know, I want you thinking and not memorizing. I'm only going to ask you to memorize three numbers 15, 14, and 25. You guys got that? 15, 14, and 25, and I'll show you why. No biochemistry or minimal. I'm going to try and give you a lot of steak, not too much system. Disclosures, I don't make a penny. I pay to be here. I suck at PowerPoint. There's not a single original idea in this lecture. Here's where all the original ideas are. This is the book. Acid fluid bases and electrolytes make ridiculously simple. It's timeless. It's 30 years old. Get this book. Everything fluid and electrolytes in this book. You will be a wizard. It's 20 bucks. You're all probably a couple hundred grand in debt. Invest another 20. And some props and kudos to Corey Slovis at National. I've never met him, but I plagiarized some of his stuff. Mike Winters, who did the studies on plasma, he's critical care with a molecule. I have met him, and he's mentored me on some of this stuff, so props and kudos. Basically, bottom line in academics, if you steal somebody's stuff, just mention it. And here's the most important disclosure. I get nothing from everybody. Okay. This was supposed to be a two-part thing, but we're a time press, so I'm going to squeeze it into one. So we're going to do the objectives. Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. We're not going to be going over the treatment of ethylene glycol poison. We're not going to be going over the pathophysiology of alcoholic ketoacid doses. That's a whole other topic. Invite me back, and I'll come back and do it. You can ask me questions on the side. We're going to do this systematically. I'm going to give you some acid-based terminology and definitions. We're going to do normal. Because nobody teaches normal. It's just like ultrasound. If you don't ultrasound normal, you won't know abnormals. So some definitions, some normal. We're going to go through the acid base disturbances. And good news, there's only four of them. There's only four of them. Then we're going to go systematically how to bang out an ABG. And I'll mention the BBG. For the purpose of this thing, one and the same. And then we'll bang out some case studies, a couple of which we've already hit on. So definitions. We we'll talk about all this acid base stuff. We're only talking about one thing. It's the hydrogen. It's the regulation of the hydrogen ion concentration. So an acid is anything that donates hydrogen, that raises your hydrogen ion concentration. A base is anything that accepts the hydrogen and lowers your hydrogen ion concentration. That's an acid in the base. That's it. Your hydrogen concentration and your pH. What is the pH? Just think, forget that log stuff. pH equals minus. Forget that log stuff. You don't need that log stuff. The hydrogen ion concentration is 10 to the minus pH. So if your pH is 6, your hydrogen ion concentration is 10 to the minus 6 milligrams per liter. 
your pH is 8, it's 10 to the minus 8 millicoliters per liter. And the only thing you got to know is the lower the pH, the higher the hydrogen ion concentration, the more acid. We all know lower pH, the pH of 1 is more acid than the pH of 14. And it's the Richter scale, it's logarithmic. A pH of 6 has 100 times more hydrogen than a pH of 8. It's just like the earthquakes. An earthquake of 7 is 10 times stronger than an earthquake of 6. More definitions. If your pH is between 7.35 and 7.45, you are neutral. If you're below 7.35, you are acid demon. Not acid diet, you are acid demon. If you're above 7.45, you're alkalemic, not alkali. The OCs are the processes that get you there. In other words, you could be neutral with a metabolic alkalosis, metabolic acidosis. So the OCCs are the processes, the emics are your end result. And that's going to be very important when we talk about mixed disturbances. The isoelectric principle, we're not magnets. Positives equal negatives. Very, very important when we, dis when we discuss da 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 Everyone's bugaboo, the anion gap. Oh my heavens, does this freak people out? So we're going to take a little time and bang out the anion gap because it's going to be on your in-service exam and it's going to be on your board exam. I'm going to give you more points because I'm a nice guy. I came from Tampa, Florida to help you guys pass your board and do your in-service. So you have to know two things on the, on the anion gap. One, these are negatives. Whoops. Screen left, screen left, your right, my, actually, screen right for you guys are the anions. You have measured anions, which are bicarbon chloride, and you have unmeasured anions on the bottom, phosphate, sulfate, and the most important is albumin. On the left, you have cations, measured cations, sodium, and underneath that, unmeasured cations. And the two graphs have to be the same, because positive has to equal negative. So, if you get an increase in your protein or your phosphate, your sulfate, your unmagnetic anions, that goes up. So that means one of the others has to go down. Same thing for the cations. If your cations go up, your sodium has to go down. If your cations go down, your sodium has to go up. So when we talk about the anion gap, all we're talking about is the unmeasured stuff. It's not visible. We can measure it, we just choose not to. When we do routine temp 7, we get sodium, potassium, and bicarb. But there's all this other stuff. So the anion gap is just this minus this, this space right in here. If you drew a line right from here, that's the anion gap. It's the unmeasured anions, whoops. It's the unmeasured anions minus the unmeasured cations. Everybody with me? Let me do it again. Is that, the, is that, that whole anion gap thing you got two things. The number of anions has to stay constant. The cations have to stay constant. One goes up, the other goes down. And the anion gap measures unmeasured anions minus unmeasured cations. You can sim simplify by saying there are no cations, and the anion gap is just a measure of unmeasured anions. So if your albumin goes up, your anion gap goes up. That's an unmeasured anion. If you have low albumin, if you have low albumin, your anion gap goes down. So you can have an anion gap as it goes in some an albumin of one with a normal anion gap. So you have to correct the anion gap for the albumin. The anion gap is basically just unmeasured anions. Make believe cations is zero. But you're going to get a question on your boards about anions and cations. They're going to give you someone with an anion gap of zero. And it's going to be multiple myeloma because those proteins are positive. So you have an increase in the unmeasured cations. So the anions minus the cations is going to be equal to zero. I guarantee you on your in-service, you'll have an anion gap question. I'm giving you another point. But in practicality, how do we compute the anion gap? It's the sodium minus the chloride plus the bicarb. That's this area right here. That's this from right across from here to there. That's what that is. Do it the same way every time. You want to put the potassium involved in it? Make that fine, but just do it the same way every single time. And the normal is between 9 and 16. Any questions on the anion gap that wakes people out? All good? Now, those are the definitions. Now, normal. The body maintains a normal physiologic pH of 7.4. Why? I don't know, but that's, why, that's where all the enzymes work. So the body maintains a hydrogen ion concentration of 10 to the minus 7.4. It's essential for normal biochemistry. How do we do this? Your body is an acid-making machine. It makes acid. Your body fights off the equal acid through three mechanisms. 
buffers, which is solution to your blood, the lungs, and your kidneys. It's a very well-tuned system. So what's a buffer? A buffer is a solution of acid and base that when you drop the hydrogen ion in there, it consumes the hydrogen ion. And the one we all talk about is the bi bicarbonate buffer. This is one of a hundred buffers in your body, but this is the big boy. It's important because the body can control the bicarbonate and the CO2. In the bicarbonate buffer, when you drop a hydrogen ion in, it consumes a bicarbonate ion, becomes H2CO3, carbonic acid, which becomes CO2. So in this buffer system, bicarbonate is the base, CO2 is the acid, and that's the only biochemistry you need to know. This Henderson Hasselbach crap, don't even worry about it. The only thing you need to know here, in any buffer solution, the pH is proportional to the base over the acid. The base is the numerator, the denominator is the acid. And in this system, the pH is equal to bicarb over CO2. And that's great because we can control the bicarb and CO2. Since the bicarb equals, the pH equals bicarb over CO2, the lungs control the CO2 and the kidneys control the bicarb. So that's it. So, what's the normal acid your body makes? It makes two types. The body makes CO2 from metabolism of carbs and fat, and your body makes hydrogen, which is called non-volatile from protein. When your body makes CO2, your lungs say bye-bye, and you blow it off. Life's great. What happens to the hydrogen ion? Okay, now I get to do my stick now. Bicarb, okay. bicarb, CO2. Bi hydrogen comes into solution. The bicarb is consumed. The CO2 goes up. So you're out of balance. Then your lungs take that excess CO2 and say bye-bye, fix that. And then your kidneys secrete hydrogen and regenerate the bicarb so back to normal. So it's one, two, three. That's how your body fights off acid. Hydrogen. Consume the buffer, bicarb is down, CO2 goes up, blow off the CO2, raise the bicarb. You're done. That's when everything's working perfectly. That's normal regulation. Acid base disturbances are when something goes wrong with either the bicarb or the CO2. It's disease. And we're going to talk about that. Now we get, we, we've done no, definitions, we've done normal. Now we're going to disease states. There's only two, remember the fraction, pH is bicarb over CO2. There's only two things that can go wrong. If anything goes wrong with the bicarb, that's called metabolic. If anything goes wrong with the CO2, that's called respiratory. So I'm going to give you a two-by-two two graph because there's only four processes. They can be mixed, but there's only four processes. A metabolic acidosis lowers your bicarb. A metabolic alkalosis raises your bicarb. A respiratory acidosis raises your CO2. And the alkalosis lowers the CO2 because the pH is equal to the bicarb over the CO2. Everyone with me? Only four things you can have. Acid-based disturbance. You get a primary. Something messes up the bicarb or the CO2. Your body then fights back with a compensation. If the body messes up the bicarb, the lungs are going to fix the CO2 to keep the fraction the same. So the secondary disturbance is a response to the primary. It's in the opposite direction. If you have a metabolic acidosis, you'll have a respiratory alkalosis. But the important thing is, always remember, the bicarb and the CO2 move in the same direction. If the bicarb goes up, you have a metabolic alkalosis. So the body is going to raise the CO2 with a respiratory acidosis. The compensatory move in the CO2 and the fighting, it's always in the same direction. If they move in opposite directions, you've got more than one problem. The primary, the, the compensation is never complete. And that's going to be important when we look for mixed disturbance. Everyone got the compensation? If bicarb goes up, CO2 goes up. If bicarb goes down, CO2's got to go down. If CO2 goes up, bicarb's got to go up. They move in the same direction. With me on the secondary? Okay. Let's go through the four basic disturbances. Oh, we're rocking it. We're, we're rocking that. We're getting plenty of time. Metabolic acidosis. It's a decreased bicarb. That's it. It's simple as that. There's only two ways you can have a decreased bicarb. Your body can make extra hydrogen, and you buffer the bicarb, and it goes down. And that happens from excess hydrogen production, or the kidneys can't excrete the hydrogen. Or you can lose bicarb, per se. And where are the two places we lose bicarb? 
pee and poo. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Essentially, when you when you have a bicarb, it's pee or poo. So those are the only ways metabolic that you can have a low bicarb. You make too much hydrogen, or your kidney doesn't excrete it, or your kidneys lose bicarb, or your gut loses bicarb. Forget this peripancreatic fistula crap. You'll never see it. Metabolic acidosis is defined by the associated anion, and I'm getting perilously close to getting into trouble with probably the academic emergency medicine community if I'm going to take my chances. The anion gap acidosis is caused by excess hydrogen production. The body's making excess hydrogen because these hydrogen ions have to come in an anion. Remember, isoelect, for every positive, it has to be a negative. When your body makes hydrogen, DKA, lactate, it has an anion with it. The anion gap acidosis increases your unmeasured anions. I will go through that. And they're endogenous or exogenous. Your body either makes it or you, or you take the stuff in. Your non-anion gap acidoses are caused by your bicarb loss from the GI or your kidney or increased chloride injection. For example, the first speaker this morning was talking about giving someone a DKA normal saline. You're giving them chloride. There's no other anion, so the bicarb has to go down. If you lose bicarb from your kidneys or your gut, there's no anion being created, so you've got to maintain chloride because the number of anions has to remain the same. So the metabolic acidosis is defined by the associated anion. Everyone with me? Here's where I get in trouble. Everyone loves mud piles. Not me, but mud piles will be on your board, so I don't know it. If you look at this mud pile stuff, most of the stuff is actually lactate. Metformin, fenformin, iron, iron, INH, and lactate are actually lactate. Even salicylate is mostly a lactate acidosis. So why memorize all this stuff? Just memorize the lactate. Now there's some other ones like methanol, uremia, the ketone you gotta know. But I'm not a big butt pile guy. Let's make it simpler. The Haber alternative classification of anion gap acidosis. Endogenous. These are the things your body makes. Lactate. I'm not gonna be starting to go type A, type B. We're not playing that. Don't have enough time. Endogenous is lactate, ketoacidosis, whether it's from diabetic or alcoholic or starvation, and the renal acids. When your GFR goes below 20%, the phosphates and the sulfates that come with the hydrogen can't be excreted. So in all of these, you have increased unmeasured anions, and they're all endogenous. It's stuff that's already in your body. The exogenous ones are from metabolisms of toxins. Salicylate is a toxin. Salicylate is a weak acid, so it's not the salicylate that causes the acidosis. It's the cellular hypoxia, it's the lactate. Methanol and ethylene glycol, that's another hour of discussion, we're not going to go into it. But those get metabolized into either formic acid or oxalic acid, those are the toxic things. These are exogenous products. So when you have an elevated anion gap acidosis, it's got to be one of these six things. If it's lactate, you've got to reverse yourself and find out what's causing it. The differential for the lactate has a lot of the mud pile stuff. Cellular hypoxia, tissue hypoxia, drugs, blah, blah, blah. Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Carbon monoxide, cyanide, et cetera. So let's look at the normal anion gap acidosis. To get one, two, five, and six, just four and uh, three and four. Pure poop. If your bicarb's low and the anion gap's normal, it's pure. Now remember, you have to correct the anion gap for the albumin. If you have a low albumin, you can still have an elevated anion gap acidosis without an anion gap because the albumin's lower. Let's look at the respiratory compensation. In a, metabolic alkali in a metabolic acidosis, you're lowering bicarb. So what direction does your CO2 have to go? Lower. Same. It has to go the same way. If you have to lower your CO2, it's a partial correction. How much is it supposed to go down? You've got two ways of doing it. The Winters formula looks very complicated. It's in your MD cow. Don't memorize it. I like the Slovis rule of 15. Within reason, it's pretty damn good. The appropriate CO2 is your bicarb plus 15. Normal bicarb is 24. You have a metabolic acidosis that takes your bicarb down to 12. Your CO2 should go from 40 to 27. Just add 15 to the bicarb. And it works for metabolic acidosis and alkalosis. Remember I told you to memorize three numbers? 15 is the first one. So memorize 15, 14, and 25. Memorize 15. And if you're stuck, just put the damn thing in empty towel so it'll, it'll work for you. That's the appropriate level of PCO2. All right, let's go to a respiratory acidosis. Sorry, can you say that again? So that's for the two. Yes. Your bicarb, you're, you're, you're swimming at 24 is your bicarb right now. You go into DKA right in front of me. Your bicarb drops to 12. Your CO2 should go from 40 to 27. 
That's the appropriate level of respiratory compensation. Your body will start to and 20, if your CO2 is 27 as opposed to 40, that's normal. You'd have a metabolic acidosis with an appropriate respiratory compensation. Every primary disturbance comes with a compensation. The key is, is it excessive, normal, or inappropriate? That's when you get mixed disturbance. We're getting to that. that. Does that answer your question? Okay. Respiratory acidosis is an elevation of PCO2. And they come in two flavors, acute and chronic. Acute is if I tie a noose around your trachea. Chronic is if you're a COPD or something with chronic hypercarbia. So your CO2 goes up. So your compensation has to be, bicarb does what? Oh, same direction. So you have metabolic, this time, this is opposite. Now you have a metabolic compensation. Because you primary disturbance CO2, so you have metabolic compensation. In acute, your kidneys work slower than the lungs. So you don't get a lot of compensation. If it's chronic, you get a chronic elevation of the bicarb. That's why in these COPD years that are walking around with pHs of 738, your CO2 is 70. And the bicarb is 35 or 36 because the kidneys are maintaining more bicarb. It's an appropriate metabolic compensation. The primary disturbance is CO2 growing up. The bicarb's got to go up. And if I told you a second number to memorize, 14, here's why. So every 10, the CO2 goes up. In acute, the bicarb goes up by 1. And in chronic, it goes up by 4. So if it's between 1 and 4, it's acute on chronic between the ranges. So that's the second number to memorize. 15 is for... Respiratory compensation, 14 is for metabolic compensation of an acidosis. So 15 and 14. Let's do metabolic alkalosis. You're the most fun, but very, very rare, actually. It can only be one thing. It's an increased bicarb. That's the only way you get a metabolic alkalosis. And there's only two ways of doing it. Actually, it's three ways. You lose hydrogen. You lose hydrogen, you don't bump for the bicarb. The bicarb goes up. Your kidneys can over-retain bicarb, and the whole differential diagnosis of what does that. We're not getting into saline sensitive, saline resistant. We're not doing that. Just want you to think about metabolic. And the third way of raising your bicarb is you can eat it. What two products over the counter? And we actually had a picture of one on one of the slides earlier by Dr. Serrano. What two over the counter products that people ingest cause a metabolic alkalosis? What's that? Liquid condition. Uh, another, not, not common, another, another, more common. Your stomach hurts. Tom's. And we had a picture of it in the DKA lecture. Thinking so. My most bizarre metabolic alkalosis case was a lady from Georgia right here who's chugging down bacon so. So anyway, so three ways to get your bicarb up. We, this is Jacoby, people. I've seen, I've seen my all-time record sodium was 89 from Bronx State. And my all-time high sodium was 181, both here. I had a Bronx State kid with a sodium of 89 in, 19, in 1987. You guys still get Bronx State transfers? Yep. With that form? And no you, form now, they just... They don't come with a form? <laughs> <laughs> you don't get a form? At least get a form. At least try to, you know, take, you know, client lasting eight days ago. Something like client lasting eight days ago. You know, something like that. And there were two things I always remember. The Bronx State form always gave me palpitations, and the other one is 3 a.m. First it's the smell, then it's the footsteps. What am I talking about? The smell comes in first, then you hear the footsteps. Plop, 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 plop. Tons of them. Like who said it? The fireman. It's the fireman. First you see, you smell them out, there's about 20 of them, and you're coming in, being clapped on the, um, on the thing. That's still, that has to still happen here, right? You get the you get the fire and only cut the fires. We still, we still dive people in City Island? No, no, no. The here now. The chain, or chambers on campus? Oh, well, up there. It's been a while. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you a story about that. I hated hyperbaric medicine so much, I told John I'd do an extra month of nights. So, I, so I, I never dove in the hyperbaric chamber. I did, I did an extra month of nights. That's also why I got out of my research month. <laughs> Some people are, are cut out to do research, some aren't, I'm um, not. Sorry. So anyway, that's the metabolic alkalosis. So again, you get a compensation. Your bicarb goes up. What does your CO2 have to do? It goes up. You get a respiratory acidosis. And da -da -da -da, here's your third number, 25. For every 10, actually, no, that's not correct. We're not, what's your PCO? This is a metabolic problem. 
So it's a respiratory compensation. You can do it one of two ways. For every 10, your body cup goes up. You see, it goes up by 7, or you can use the rule of 15 again. The first rule is in your MD cow. You don't need it. Or you can just pop the rule. You know, if you have a metal, if somebody takes your, for you, if somebody takes your body cup from 24 to 30, your lungs should make your CO2 45. You should have a respiratory acid that should go from 40 to 45. So the rule of 15 for any metabolic problem, acidosis or alkalosis works. Respiratory alkalosis, it's decreased PaCO2, it's hyperventilation. It's also acute and chronic. Acute respiratory alkalosis is the most common acid basis. So pain, fever, sepsis, anxiety, all cause a respiratory alkalosis. What's the most common cause of chronic respiratory alkalosis that I have here? So it's cheating. Pregnancy. Progesterone is a respiratory stimulant. You have a decreased functional residual reserve. That's why we see people in the second and third trimester pregnancy who come in short of breath. And we're forced to consider PEs. And I'm still looking for my first damn PE, one of these second or third trimester short of breath people. But we'll keep looking. Anyway, metabolic compensation when it's acute, the kidneys don't work. And it's chronic, you lower your bicarb. And this is, a, this is a 25. In acute, for every 10 that your CO2 drops, your bicarb drops by 2. And if it's chronic, for every 10, your CO2, your CO2 drops, bicarb drops by 5. This is why if you see a pregnant female and they have a respiratory alkalosis, their bicarbs are going to be 19 or 20. Because they're chronically hypermetabolic. Anyway, respiratory alkalosis, you're not going to see on your boards. So, we're going to take this through. All the way, we're only 25 minutes. We're going to take this through and do the cases, if that's okay with you. In the interest of time, get it on lunch. Anyone work last night besides Jeremy? Oh, you're working tonight? Okay. Anyway, if you work last night, I'll get you, see if I can get you home. Clinical approach to acid base disorders. It's just like an EKG. you got to suspect something. You do a history and physical. If I stub my toe, I'm not getting an ABG, VBG. Suspect an acid base is stuff. But most commonly, it happens. You get something with vomiting or diarrhea or something, you get the electrolyte, you're not even doing a BBG, and the bicarb looks awkward, or the anti gap looks off, and then that triggers you into the acid base role of things. And again, my, my two cents on the BBG thing, in the state of non shock, BBGs are pretty good. You worry about the metabolic component of it, it screws up the compensation formulas just a smidge, but in the non shock state, the pH is a little lower, the CO2 is a little higher, but it's pretty good. EKA is 100% BBG, it's usually not. It screws up the winner's formula just a smidge, but that's better than sticking someone in their artery. If you're in shock, all bets are off, but now you're getting poor perfusion, blah, blah, blah. Your CO2 is going up way higher, your pH is going down, and it may not reflect the actual lungs, but may actually reflect the perfusion. So that's my maybe, spiel. Maybe you're more active. It may, you know, it may be. Would come yeah, it, it may be, yeah, it may be more active to how the patient's doing it. And I'm not the ABG, BBG expert, so I'll just keep it right here. I'll let you handle that one. Anyway, so ABG interpretation or BBG interpretation, same difference. Five steps. Corey Slovis says everything has five steps, five reasons, or five answers. Corey Slovis thinks the Ten Commandments should be two groups of five. But anyway, so I'm going to plagiarize his jokes. I'm going to plagiarize his jokes. Step one, what's the pH? Only three options on the menu. You can be acidemic, neutral, or alkalemic. Two, based on the disturbance in pH, what's the primary process? And you can look at the bicarb and the CO2 for that. Three, is there a second primary process? And you do that by checking compensation. If the compensation is where it should be, there is not a primary, secondary, primary process. If the compensation is excessive or inadequate, there is another process. I'm going to go over that. Four, Always, 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 always check the anion gap. The first the case we had on the metabolic alkalosis, metabolic acidosis case, the pH was 7.32. The patient had a metabolic acidosis, metabolic alkalosis. So even in a normal pH, you've got to check the anion gap on every set of electrolytes because it will give you mixed disturbances. That's four. And five, this is for the overachievers. You know, back in the day, by the way, there were two types of docs in the Bronx. There were Jacoby Giants and Monty Midgets, but then they uh, combined the programs and ruined that but back in the day. Anyway, for you Jacoby Giants out there, you Jacoby Giants out there, overachievers that you all are, if you want to do a fifth step, if the anion gap is elevated, check the ratio for the elevation of the anion gap versus the drop in the bicarb. 
And that can clue you to the presence of a non-ion gap acidosis or an alkalosis. I am not going to beat that point to death. That's step number five if you really want to be an overachiever in a Jacobi job. So, let's take our flow sheet. Let's go with acid. Let's go with acidemia. pH is less than 735. Pretty simple. Step one. What's the primary process? If the bicarb's low, if the bicarb's low, it's metabolic. If the PCO2 is elevated, it's primary problem is respiratory acidosis. If the one is hot, or if, if it's both, then you have a dual problem. But you can still follow, just pick one disturbance and follow it through, and the rest will fall out and go through the album. So what's the pH? What's the primary disturbance? Then in metabolic acidosis, let's look at the compensation. Let's use our rule of 15. If the CO2 is adequate, you're done. No secondary process. If the CO2 is less than expected, Something else besides appropriate respiratory compensation is driving that. You also have a respiratory alkalosis. If the compensation is inadequate, in other words, the CO2 is higher than it should be, not blowing off the CO2, you have a respiratory acidosis. Four, is the anion gap elevated? And what's the, if it is, what's that anion gap to bicarb ratio we're not going to talk about? That's how you work with a metabolic acidosis. Every time, you'll never miss. You can't miss. Respiratory acidosis. Now you have a problem in the CO2. Now the CO2 is up. That's your primary process. Check for compensation. Check your bicarb. Is it acute or chronic? For every 10 the CO2 goes up, the bicarb goes up 1. In chronic, for every 10 the CO2 goes up, the bicarb goes up by 4. If it's in the middle, it's acute on chronic. And if it's outside the limits, you have a secondary primary process. Again, we're going to go through cases. Check the anion gap. Alkalinium. Same difference. Same difference. Bicarb's elevated. If the bicarb's elevated, it's a primary metabolic alkalosis. If the CO2 is decreased, it's respiratory. Let's do a metabolic alkalosis. Is the respiratory response appropriate? Do a little 15, or if every 10 the bicarb goes up, the CO2 goes up by 7, it's an empty calc. Is it appropriate, excessive, or inadequate? Don't forget the anion gap. Even in, even in alkalemia, you have to check the anion gap. If you walk away with one thing here, check the dawn anion gap. Because I spent five minutes teaching you about it. Respiratory alkalosis is the same thing. It's a, what's the, neutral. We had a case of almost neutral. That first case, that was in EKA, I had a pH of 7.32, with an anion gap of 34. You've got to look for primary disturbances. You've got to look at the CO2, you've got to look at the anion gap, and you've got to look at the bicarb for neutral. So your work's not done. That's the mistake we made. Put it up, oh, the pH looks normal. And we have a case of that. Everyone want to bang into some cases real quick? Take a, take a brief stretch? Okay. Okay, case studies. That was a very brief stretch. Case <laughs> I'm going for the world record on time. That's what I am. I'm a filler. I go as slow as you want or as fast as you want. I'll get you where you need to be and get you out on time. It's like I tell jokes for 30 minutes. Case studies. Again, focus history and physical. Suspect the disorder and get labs. Don't get an EKG, just get labs. Four steps, maybe five, if you're going to be an overachiever. Think mixed and always look at the anion gap. If you walk out of here with one of these, all five of these, you're gold. If not, put it in empty cow. That really pissed me off, by the way. I went to ASAP. Every year I go to ASAP to see what guru is going to lecture on this. See they do it better than me. Finally, this year's guy was pretty good. He did, the guy two years ago in Vegas, 8 a.m. after a night vendor the night before, 8 a.m. I go in the guy says, "This is all bullshit. All you need to do is put an empty cow." I said, "I got up for that. Thanks a lot, pal." Anyway, all you senior guys should go to ASAP. By the way, we're going to talk about that during lunch. Okay, we're going to do a case. Here's a case. And another thing for your boards. The answer is always in the history. The answer, a good test writer will give you the answer. You should be able to get the answer without knowing anything. If you're really good. That's how you all got here. You got into medical school. You did all your end They're all good test takers. So just keep using You're not a good test taker? So who, your parents make a lot of donations or something? <laughs> all right. All right. Okay. 57 year old male, acutely short of breath. Let's look at the numbers. The pH is 732. So are we acidemic or alkalinic or neutral? 
You got you to gotta play with me here, guys. Acidemia. So we got to look, have acidemia. What's the primary process? We have a respiratory acidosis. So now we have to look at compensation. The CO2 has gone up, this is acutely. The CO2 has gone up from 40 to 60. What should the bicarb have gone up from? Number 14. The bicarb should only go up one for every 10. The bicarb should only go up to 26. Here it's 29. If this was chronic shortened the breath, the CO2 has gone up by 20. CO2 has gone up by 20. The bicarb should go up by 8 to 32. So you're between the ranges here. So you'll have an acute on chronic respiratory acidosis. Though the compensation is excessive for acute. It's compensation over the two things of bicarb, it's five. So your compensation is excessive, so you're acute on chronic. Everyone with me on that? The chem 7 anion on gap or otherwise high no more. That's enough respiratory. Now we're going to get to the fun stuff because always on your boards, you're not going to get this on the, you're going to get a metabolic acidosis on your boards. Guaranteed. I'm here to give you more free points on your insurance exam. We all want to pass that. Yeah? Do we actually count that anymore? Or that would be crazy about it when I was doing this. Okay. Double dips. What am I telling you? It's mixed. I'm already telling you it's mixed. I'm, I'm, I'm throwing the answer. I'm putting it on, I'm putting it on a softball T point where you don't whack it out of the park. I'm going to give you some more information. History. 61-year-old male, 61, anyone with severe arthritis, confused, and agitated. Okay? So you get some labs. And the way this case would probably go, you probably wouldn't get the ABG right off the bat on this case. Because there's no real pulmonary symptoms. You get the electrolytes, and you see the bicarb is low, and you see some other. That would probably, in retrospect, trigger a BBG. But let's make believe you got it all in one shot. So what's our pH? 734. So what are we? We're well, acidemic, but barely. Okay. So what's our primary process? Metabolic. The bicarb is down. Now, if bicarb is 12, what should, now, compensation, what should the CO2 be? Rule 15, 27, what is it? 18. So something is driving that CO2 further down. So what else do you have? We have a respiratory walk. Alkalosis. So we have a primary metabolic acidosis, a compensated respiratory alkalosis, and a primary respiratory alkalosis. So you have two primary processes. What's the anion gap? 27, high or low? High. So now you have an elevated anion gap, so we're going to shift and go to our anion gap algorithm. Let's go through endogenous. Well, yeah, I mean, let's go through endogenous. Let's go through endogenous. <laughs> There's always a plant in every group. Yeah. There's always a plant in every group. But anyway, but go through it systematically. Endogenous, lactate. Lactate may be slightly bumpy, but it's not going to be a big deal. Ketones. The glucose and renal function are normal, your ketones will be negative, and your renal function for your renal acids, negative. So it's not an endogenous problem, so it's an exogenous problem. So what are your toxins that cause a high anion gap acidosis? Salicylate and the atypical alcohols. Does this sound like an atypical alcohol presentation? They cause a really high anion gap acidosis. And you got arthritis, confused, and agitated, part of the toxic drug for salicylate not just the numbers of a patient front. This is solicit. And by the way, I've been burned almost twice on this. Even if the labs are normal, but not an anion gap or anything like that, and the old, older person who's confused consider salicylates that only get a Tylenol level as a shotgun, and the older people I consider salicylates. It's a sepsis mimicker, even without the metabolic stuff, because it really is a CNS toxin. So that only get a Tylenol level for unsuspected toxin. I, I would throw an acid level in too. When I was here, I was told never, ever do that. You know, never blind the order solicit unless you have the last old person, all the mental status, confused, agitated, consider solicitate toxicity, even without the metabolic acidosis. So this is a double dip. This is a metabolic acidosis, respiratory alkalosis, primary and compensatory from solicitate intoxication. Good. We got this. This is my case. I love this case. I do. This is a real case. The numbers were fudged a little bit. This is one of my cases. You are off limits. 80-year-old male, confused and agitated, working in the garage. Stop. Already, what is what what is this case? No. Give me a category of things. It's Tom's. Why? Because the 80-year-old guy got into the garage. It, you know, these are very important things. In emergency medicine, 
Forget the answer base nonsense. In everything, it's the timeline. Strokes, how long? This isn't some person living in a nursing home for seven weeks, decrepit and dehydrated. This is a functioning person who got into the garage, and something happened in the garage. The answers are already there. So you already know this is going to be a tox case. Now the question is going to be, what's the tox? And carbon monoxide is not unreasonable. It's not quite the toxic drama. Does carbon monoxide do confuse and agitate? No, carbon, I mean, the toxic drama carbon monoxide is a little lethargic, mental status. Carbon monoxide is more of a doggy downer as opposed to a puppy up in, in the toxic drug world. Nothing, nothing is 100%. Nothing is ever 100%. The mama too says, classic is 15%. But I'm saying, this does not sound like carbon monoxide toxic drug. Let's look at his vital signs, a little tachycardic. A little hypertensive. Let's look at his labs. pH is 709. Ooh. PCO2 is 14. PCO2 is 144. His bicarb is 9. What's our pH? He's acidemic. What's the primary process? Metabolic. Let's look at his compensation. What should his bicarb, what should his CO2 be? We're looking at 14. 24. It's 14. So he also has a respiratory alkalosis, probably from being confused and agitated. What's his anion gap? 30, it's high. Let's go through our differential anion gap. Lactate, yeah, a little bit. Ketones, maybe trace. The kidney function is normal, so it's not an endogenous problem. It's an exogenous problem, a, ta a metabolite of a toxin. So what's his toxin? He was working in the garage. Carbon monoxide could do the numbers, but it's, that's going to be a more gradual thing. Say it again. Andy Friedrich has. Yeah, this guy broke up with his girlfriend and said, that, that antifreeze looks good, took a couple of swigs, it was sweet. And interestingly enough, he presented with some mental status, because remember, ethylene glycol is not the toxin that kills you, that just makes you drunk. It's the oxalic acid that does it, that causes the ultimate mental status of the renal failure. We had this patient on 4-FP and had him dialyzed, because he had an osmolar gap that was off the chart. We jumped on this one. His creatinine bumped, but we saved the deeper in recovery, he came off dialysis. But you have to jump on this before develop the renal failure, and before you, you know, because again, this is going to be on your boards too, if the osmolar gap goes down, the acid anion gap goes up, craft, I'm sure it's in Tintinelli, we're not going to make this into a dissertation on the atypical outcomes. But that's the, that's the whole process. So you have a primary metabolic acidosis, a respiratory acidosis from agitation, it's at the anion gap type, you take these 4 FP, and these dialysis. This was, this was a really cool case. Regarding the hypothermia, have a yeah, you can, yeah, you can, this, and here's the other thing about lactate, people will dive into lactate a little bit, anything, lactate is a mimic, anything that causes hyperoxidation, converting NAD to NADH2, will shift your pyruvate lactate ratio to the point where it shifts more to lactate. So if you have a binge drinker, if you have a binge drinker, coming when I will have a free, lactate is going to be three and a half to four. They get a type B lactic acidosis from your altered pyruvate lactic level. Same thing in DKA. Same thing in salicylate. It's all going to have an elevation of lactic. It doesn't mean sepsis. That's my spiel on lactate. Anything that, and anything that hyperoxidates, oxidation of fatty acids, oxidation of alcohol, AKA will have the same thing. Anything where you're hyperoxidating will shift your NAD to NADH2 redox potential. So the pyruvate to lactate ratio shifts towards lactate. That's part of the thing. I didn't want to go into lactate. That's my thing on type B. I didn't really mean to the patient to be hypothermic. I didn't really want to make um, sepsis part of this case. I have, I, you know, but of course, I do have a sepsis case. Ah, uh, this is one of my favorites too. This is a good one. Again, I made the numbers up, but the principle of the case kind of is the same. Twenty-seven-year-old with severe weakness for two days. This is sort of like a trap case that we presented in follow-up rounds. Remember, emergency medicine. I know you're all here at Jacoby. I don't want to see them unless they're really sick. In the real world, resuscitation is kind of rare. This is the cases that you see over and over again. And we don't present the whole home crap in follow-up rounds. So if the case is being presented in follow-up rounds, no one's saying send them all. Because everyone sitting there, I knew every one of those cases had a kicker. But this, that's the trap of emergency medicine. You've got to keep your guard up for cases like this. Because this is what you see in the real world. BP at 60 got shot in the belly. That's easy. You know, SCL of that, that's an easy case. These are the tricky cases. That's what, and that's what community management emergency, unfortunately, you got to keep your guard up. 
Because if you just get yourself trapped and I'm only going to see people unless the BP-60, hell, that's easy. I'm not sitting anyone with BP-60 home. So disposition is easy. These are the tough ones. Do you get labs on these people? I don't know. Severe weakness for two days. This woman was really weak. She couldn't even stand up on her own muscle. So in order to get labs on these people, like in the case we had before, is there were abnormal vital signs on every single one. In this case, you got some labs on this person. Severe epigastric pain for two weeks. There's a clue. So you got her electrolytes. You got her pH on the bottom. So what is her prime? What is her pH? Alkalemic. You know how to throw a metabolic alkalosis case at you. Okay. So she's alkalemic. So what's the primary process? Metabolic. Let's look at her compensation. The bicarb is 44. What should the CO2 be? 59, well, 15, it's 51. So she has a metabolic alkalosis and a respiratory alkalosis. What's the anion gap? Normal. So this woman has a primary metabolic alkalosis and a respiratory alkalosis. No acidosis, the anion gap is unremarkable. Why? What's the differential of alkalosis? You know, the potassium, in treatment, you have to fix the potassium. The potassium is low because of the metabolic alkalosis, because it's, it's all intracellular shifts. Hydro, acidosis sends hydrogen into cells, potassium out. Alkalosis does the other way around. Hydrogen ions come out, potassium in. And she's not been eating or drinking as well. But why is this woman? What's the differential diagnosis for metabolic alkalosis? Remember the three things? Is she vomiting? Is her kidney retaining too much bicarb? Well, sort of. And more importantly, what is she eating? She's at the gas again. Tums. Tums. So this is a Tums ingestion. She's been and her calcium was high too. She was pulsing on calcium carbonate, which is Tums. So her calcium was a little bit on the high side as well. And the way you sort this out, this is a, this is this is really being a Jacoby overachiever. The way you sort this all out, what urine test can help you? A urinary pH is a huge test because in all the other metabolic alkaloses, whether it be from vomiting, whether the kidney is spontaneously, all well, the hyperalbo stage where the kidney retains bicarb, you retain the bicarb, you're not excreting it. This woman's like a water drink. She's chugging down bicarb and the kidney is trying to get rid of it. So in this patient, the urinary pH would be 8. In all the other cases of metabolic alkalosis, you have a paradoxical aciduria. The urine pH is actually acid. So this patient would have a urinary pH, and that's how we. This is actually the baking soda case was here at Jacoby in 1986. This was a case I had a couple of years ago. So this is a metabolic alkalosis from Tums. So the, the urine pH was high because she's in, just like when you have hyponatremia from water drinking, you're trying to dilute the urine. Your urine alkalosis would be about 100. Where most other causes of hyponatremia, you have either appropriate or inappropriate ADH, and your urine is concentrated. You know, she's just trying to pour out the bicarb. She can't retain it all. She can't get rid of it all. That's why her pH is fine. The kidney wants to get rid of bicarb, but you're eating Tums and Tums and Tums. So her urine pH, she would have a urine pH of 8. All other metabolic alkalosis have a paradoxical acid urine. Triple play. So what am I telling you? Three things. And this is very similar to the case that Dr. Serrano had. A diabetic, young vomiting abdominal pain. A little tachycardic. So, what's the pH? What's that? Alkalemic. What's the primary process? Metabolic. What sh let's look at compensation. What should the CO2 be? Rule of 15. 49. She's 41. So she has a respiratory alkalosis from pain. She has a metabolic alkalosis from vomiting. But what else do we have to look at? We have to look at the anion gap. The anion gap is high. It's well, it's uh, one nineteen. So when you have an anion gap, you got to figure out why. So just look at your anion gap algorithm. Let's look, let's, and her sugar is nine eighty five. Her creatinine is one point nine, which is not really enough to cause the tension of renal acid. So what are the other two endogenous ones? Lactate and ketones. So this is DKA too. So this is a metabolic alkalosis, respiratory alkalosis, DKA patient. So this patient needs the insulin drip and all the other. Things. And all the other stuff. This is a triple play. Right. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah. 
I, first thing I do here, as we learned earlier today, you can't give this woman, I would start with fluids. No, not until I take that. Passive, absolutely. Remember this, K kills. A BKA, hyperosmolar, K kills, whether it be high or low. Do not give insulin with this. Just giving crystalloid will help lower this person's sugar. Do not give insulin so you can fix that K, absolutely. But she is in DKA, will need some help. You've got to fix that K first. Yes, absolutely. K kills. The person who kills you most immediately in DKA is K. Not the A, it's K, K kills. We'd like to surround it with you, Lee. All right. Another cool case. Oh, we're rocking this. Febrile and Alter. 72 year old male lethargic. This is what was going to be the thought you were talking about. 72 year old male lethargic. Temperature is 103 BP of 80. What's this guy got? He has. Yeah, and, and by the way, all that craziness about, oh, I know, I got to do another damn sepsis problem. The problem is, CMS is going to base your pay based on it. You're going to get shoved in sepsis data banks. So now it's not whack on sepsis. I mean, that now people with strep throats are getting lactates and craziness because we can all laugh about it, but the government is basing your pay and reimbursement based on these things. Even if you don't give a dialysis patient 30 milligrams per kilogram, so we can all laugh about it, but it's in there and the quality assurance wackos in your hospital are going to come after you with this stuff. So just get, I don't know what to tell you, but sepsis is real. It was, remember at one point it was strokes. It's shifting out from strokes to sepsis. It was STEMIs. It was pain. It's always something that we're shifting to, and next month will be something else. But anyway, it's real. When you get 12 letters from your medical director that says you have sepsis, you know, it's a problem. Anyway, this is sepsis, though. But there's a trick to this. What's the pH? Acid. What's the primary process? Bicarb's low. It's metabolic. Compensation. Bicarb's 13. What should your CO2 be? Rule 15. 28. What is it? 32. What's going on here? Metabolic acid doses with? Rest this, although that CO2 looks normal, it's not for this patient. This patient is not adequately compensated. This patient is getting tired, so this patient needs to be intubated or non-invasive hospital, whatever you want to do. This patient needs to be watched like a hawk. This patient is in trouble. All right, we have um, two more. Blink and you miss it. Diabetic with vomiting. What's the pH? Normal. Are we done? Everyone want to go home? I'll go home. What's the PCO2? Normal. What's the bicarb? Normal. What have we not looked at yet? Anion gap. Okay. What's the anion gap? 21, it's high. We have every anion gap must be explained. This person may just have a high albumin. Every anion gap must be explained. That's when the albumin is normal. So let's go through endogenous. Lactate's normal. Renal function's normal. Glucose is high. So what's the other endogenous ketones? This is DKA. Exogenous, there's no hidden the toxin here. There's no toxic drone. This doesn't look like salicylate. So now, you have a metabolic acidosis with a normal pH. What's the other process got to be? An alkalosis, which type? Metabolic. And here's where that anion gap to bicarb ratio comes into play. That step five overachiever Jacoby Giant thing. The anion gap has gone from 12 to 21. The bicarb hasn't changed at all. You have an anion gap acidosis, the bicarb should drop. So your anion gap to bicarb ratio is higher than it should be. So that means something else is raising that bicarb. That's a, you have an unexplained primary metabolic alkalosis from the bomb. That's where that anion gap to bicarb ratio comes into play. This is an That's step number five. And drunk is always drunk. 31-year-old homeless male, unresponsive in the park. So this is either this is either a bleed in the head or tox. You know, but you have some clues. pH 729, CO2 is 29, pH is 100. Percent. What's the process? What's the, and what's the pH? Excuse me. It's gasodema. What's the primary process? Metabolic. What's the compensation? What should the CO2 be? 
Rule 15. 29. What is it? 29. So you have a metabolic acidosis, appropriate respiratory compensation. What's the anion gap? 25. It's 25. So let's go through our increased anion gap. Let's go through endogenous. Lactate and renal function is normal. Glucose is normal. Anything endogenous there? No. Let's go exogenous. Or the toxins. Salicylate, does it sound like salicylate? Could be, but then you have a respiratory alkalosis. So it could be salicylate. But why would a 31 year old, I mean, let's see, overdose time. Salicylate is in, it's in the ballpark. But this is not the non toxication. It's an atypical alcohol. It's metabolized in formic acid. It's the same thing as the ethylene glycol. And his renal function is normal. So he needs the same treatment for FP, dialysis, and blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Well, you get, yeah, the bi this is another case, yes, you would not get, if you're right, on your drums, you have to watch out for a couple of things. On the electrolyte, the drums, alcohol is another two-hour electric. And drums can get low by for a whole ton of reasons. Alcohol and keto acidosis. Because your ketones are negative when you do your, when you, well, if you, when you go through your thing, you would have already ketone. It's probably a differential. If the ketones were to turn out to be negative on it. But it could be, this could be alcohol ketoacidosis, absolutely. But usually that comes in after binge drinking, they're not unresponsive. He has a toxin. Alcohol ketoacidosis usually doesn't make you altered. He has a toxin. Remember, methanol makes you drunk. That's, so he has an altered mental status with it. alcohol ketoacidosis, they're usually awake. But out, AKA is in, the, is in the book. I would have added, on this set of labs, I would have added a serum, a serum ketone. Yeah, the ketones can also be negative because of the beta hydroxy butyrate acetoacetate. But ketones is in your, it, it's not unreasonable to think ketones. I, I would get it. But if, remember the toxidrome for alcohol ketoacidosis, you, and it's usually not this profound. I mean, it can be. But the alcohol ketoacidosis, they're up there vomiting, they're retching, they're awake. All the mental is not usually part of the picture. But no, alcohol ketoacidosis, this guy could have took a benzo overdose and had alcohol ketoacidosis. No, good point. Can't argue that. But those, but, the point is go through everything. I think that's it on this. So any questions or anything?